All right, you're obviously from Florida. I'm not. You're much tanner. <laughs> not. I may spend a, a, a large amount of time on the beach. You do? Yes, okay. I do. Are we recording? We are recording. Oh, <laughs> don't tell that part. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's an awesome part. <laughs> okay. You ready? Are you ready for this? Yeah, I'm ready. How do you feel? Um, I'm feeling excited, a little bit nervous, but I'm glad to be here. We haven't met in person since 2017. It's been about half a decade. What has changed since we first met? Ooh, uh, a lot's changed. When you tell somebody that you have schizophrenia, how do you want them to react? I want them to not be afraid of me and not to look at me any differently than they had looked at me before. Did you ever go back and watch that first video we no. filmed? No, I don't. Why not? It's it's difficult to to see me uh, like that because that's I was very struggling with I was struggling with a hallucination during that interview. I remember looking at the comment section. People were like, "Why aren't they looking at they can't you know uh, having a hard time like looking your direction?" I was struggling with um, that hallucination, but also as someone who's autistic, I've also struggled with giving eye contact in general. Like I feel like I'm hyper aware of like, am I giving too much eye contact? Not enough eye contact? No, you know, because it's like, so I was really struggling in that uh, in that interview. How often do you hear voices? My my uh, hallucinations are almost twenty four seven. It's something that I just have learned to live with. In your original video, you said that you experienced hallucinations almost 24 seven. Mm. Is that still the case? So it's been a long road uh, on my schizophrenia journey. Um, for me now, I don't hallucinate 24 seven anymore, which like when we get, had our last interview, I honestly thought I was going to hallucinate 24 seven for the rest of my life. Like I had just been like, okay, this is, this is my life, whatnot. Um, but now I, I do still struggle with some of my auditory hallucinations and visual hallucinations, but it's not 24 seven. It's more when I'm struggling with being like stress, uh, that often comes up. You went from experiencing hallucinations 24 seven to now you can go days without it. Yeah, and honestly, uh, like I'm very, I'm very fortunate. I know that's not the case with everyone who lives with uh, schizophrenia. I know that whatever you did to decrease your hallucinations won't work for everybody, but can you just give us the play-by-play -play of how you got to the place you are today compared to when we first met in 2017? So when I was uh, struggling back in 2017, um, I was still figuring out the different treatment options that was right for me. Also back in 2017, and this is part of the reason I have a hard time looking back at that original interview, is I looked very different and I was also struggling with um, I wasn't open at the time. I was also struggling with substance uh, use. I was uh, mismanaging uh, my medication. And I think that's an important topic to talk about when we're talking about people living with schizophrenia, psychosis, and talking about different treatment options is to have that good conversation, you know, with your doctor and only take your medication, you know, as prescribed the amount and when. Because um, for me, I was struggling with my medication on how it affected my sleep. And uh, when you're someone who is a student and you're also uh, trying different uh, treatment options that's affecting your sleep, well, that's going to affect your studies as well because oftentimes I felt like, well, do I be the good patient right now, take my medication, go to sleep, whatnot? Or do I be that good student, stay up, study for my test? Or I was also an astrophysics student, do I stay up and do that, you know, telescope time? So I, I ended up having this unhealthy relationship of not taking my medication or taking too much of my medication and whatnot. And it was a very unhealthy relationship. Uh, so where I'm at now is I have a treatment routine that I stick to and I have that consistency. I also have um, a better support network now. I have a lot of great friends and colleagues that I lean and support on. Uh, so some of those changes both come from treatment, but also come from learning different coping skills that work well for me and also finding that support network 
uh, that uh, is there for me as well. And even if I don't experience some of my schizophrenia symptoms that I did, you know, back in 2017, um, I am still someone who actively has schizophrenia. I still struggle with my hallucinations, maybe not as much, um, but I do, they, they are still something prevalent in my life. There's also other symptoms within schizophrenia as well, not just uh, hallucinations. Uh, for right now, my struggle with um, with my diagnosis comes more in forms of I struggle with isolation at times. I struggle with scattered thoughts. I struggle with motivation. I struggle with uh, depression, and that's become more prevalent um, with my mental health than my hallucinations are now. Why will you isolate sometimes? Ooh, um, for me, I get into this mindset that I. I don't want people to see me. I'm kind of like embarrassed of just my looks. I'm also, um, as I mentioned before, I'm autistic and I have schizophrenia, so I also stim often. Um, I'm someone who uh, I sometimes like hit my head like this or I flap my arms and such, and I struggle with a lot of uh, internalized stigma there on just not wanting people to see, I didn't want people to see me uh, stimming. And so when I'm having days that I have a hard time passing as neurotypical, I would sometimes isolate myself. Um, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, I'm just saying that's what I struggle with. Uh, but. But now I'm getting much better at accepting myself and it's okay to stim openly. It's okay to not be masked or look, well, masked in like the, when, when you talk about masking and autism, it's about uh, not hiding your symptoms. When did you first open up about your autism diagnosis? Ooh, um, maybe less than two years ago. I, I have to like look back, but it's been very relatively recently. Has accepting your autism diagnosis been part of your decrease in hallucinations? Ooh, I haven't quite made that comparison, but I think it definitely has helped with uh, accepting me as the person that I am. In the original video we did in 2017, you said something that I loved. I'm gonna play it right here. I really will not rest until Anyone who has schizophrenia anywhere worldwide is not afraid to say the words, I have schizophrenia. Are you still pursuing that goal of helping people feel comfortable and confident talking about schizophrenia and psychosis? Absolutely, and that's something that I'm going to be continuing uh, with my advocacy work and what we're doing as a team with the nonprofit Students with Psychosis. I am so uh, happy with our and proud of the progress that we've made with students with psychosis. Students with psychosis is a nonprofit that empowers college students advocates worldwide through community building and collaboration. Why was it important for you to start this nonprofit? Because when I was a student uh, with schizophrenia, I had a hard time finding fellow peers. And when I went to other mental health uh, initiatives, Oftentimes, schizophrenia, psychosis was left out because it made people feel uncomfortable. I remember sitting down at a college club about mental health and I started opening up about some of my hallucinations and people looked at me like I was crazy. People looked at me uh, like they were kind of scared or uncomfortable. And in a way, that made it even worse because here I am in a mental health space and it made me feel even more crazy or not like I belonged. So it's important when we're talking about mental health, having initiatives on college campuses that we are including psychosis. You brought two members of the organization, Cece and Seamus, with you today. I'm gonna to interview them about their life and how students with psychosis has impacted them. So Cece and Seamus, they've been part of the SWP team uh, for a while now. They're both on the executive board. And they also both wear like two different hats. They're also uh, part of volunteer staff as well. Uh, they're on the executive board and they're also both operation uh, directors. So they're very involved behind the scenes. Prior to students with psychosis, I, at least for the most part, uh, wouldn't have dared tell anyone anything that I was experiencing. I wouldn't reach out for help. I wouldn't even, you know, I was really going through it and asked for a hug and nothing. Um, I just didn't want to um, put myself through any any complications that might arise from having to tell someone. And in having that support with students with psychosis, um, 
like recently I told one of my coworkers uh, about my experience and it was just kind of, we we're just talking back and forth and they were actually like very accepting. Um, like, I get a lot more nice surprises like that that come with taking risks that I don't feel like I would have had the, uh, uh, I would have been too afraid before students with psychosis to do something like that. Tell me about yourself, Seamus. Uh, let's see. Um, what do you want to know? Do you want to know about like, like my school, my career, my symptoms, my mental illness? When I ask you to tell me about yourself, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? Hmm. Um, I, I'm a student at Berkeley, uh, studying to be a guitar teacher. When I was a student, reaching out and trying to find psychosis-specific resources was a challenge. And there's so much power when it comes to uh, power in community, power in finding those uh, peers, feeling accepted. And I've honestly learned, I've, I've learned so much from Seamus as well, because uh, we're both fellow peers living with psychosis. I started dealing with symptoms of psychosis. Um, and when it first came on, I didn't really know what was going on. How old were you when the symptoms came on? I was about 16 or 17. Uh, at first, I had a, uh, the bipolar part of the schizoaffective disorder with the uh, bipolar type. Um, I had a depressive episode for about six months, then that just flipped on a dime into mania, and then that kind of catapulted into hallucinations. It started kind of like background noise, and then background noise turned up into hearing voices, and then constantly hearing voices. Um, I started hallucinating more, I was hallucinating demons, and that kind of uh, led to some delusions because I thought the demons were like torturing me with the voices, and it was, um, it was, a, it was a whole thing. <laughs> Do you still experience a lot of that now? Actually, it's a lot better at this point. Um, it was really bad for about like two or so years, and I... I went on a big hunt to find people who were struggling with similar things, um, which is how I found Cecilia and students with schizophrenia, and students with psychosis, excuse me, that was the original name. And I just really, really dug in trying to find ways to cope. Um, and it, it, it was hard, I, I still struggle, but it did over the years get easier, thankfully. If there's somebody experiencing their symptoms in silence, afraid to speak out, what would you say to them? First, I want to say that it's okay to not have to share everything. Uh, I know for me, when I first uh, started opening up about uh, my schizophrenia, I thought that I had to say or tell everyone about every single hallucination or symptom that I had or whatnot. Um, but it's okay um, to only share what you feel comfortable sharing at the time. Um, and it's okay to sort of build that trust uh, with, with someone. You don't have to open up everything at once. Um, also, I want to say that people care about you. Uh, there are resources out there. I, I know for me, I don't think that I would be here today if I didn't get the proper uh, medical help, if I didn't find community members and a support network uh, to be there with me on my difficult days. So people care about you. Can you tell me about Cecilia's impact in the psychosis community? Yeah, she really is. Um, she's a leader within the community. She, I think, empowers a lot of people who are feeling it's very easy to be isolated and feel kind of you know meek and powerless when dealing with something so intense and so isolating um, and she just being like loud and proud and, and getting this whole community together I think inspires a lot of people there's an event tonight for, with students with psychosis and I'm coming I'm gonna film some b-roll and probably put it in this video what is the event I'm so, so excited about the event tonight. We're having our Boston meetup uh, here. We're in Boston, and some of our students and advocates in the Boston or surrounding area will be having an open mic. We'll be having a discussion. So it's going to be a really fun event. There's going to be some music. There's going to be some.